Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today we want to discuss a couple of more application-oriented topics. We want to look into image processing and in particular into segmentation and object detection. So let's see what I have here for you. Here's the outline of the next five videos and we will first introduce the topic of course. Then we'll talk about segmentation. So we'll motivate it and discuss where the problems are with segmentation. And then we want to go into several techniques that allow you to do good image segmentations. You will see that there is actually very interesting methods that are super powerful and can be applied on a wide variety of tasks. After that, we want to continue and talk about object detection. So this is a kind of related topic. And with object detection, we then want to look into different methods, how you can find objects in scenes, and how you can actually identify which object belongs where. So let's start with the introduction. So, so far, we looked into image classification, essentially. And here you can see that the problem is that you simply have the classification to cat, but you can't make any information out of the spatial relation of objects to each other. An improvement is image segmentation. So in semantic segmentation, you then try to find the class of every pixel in the image. So here you can see in red that we marked all of the pixels that belong to the class cat. Now, if we want to talk about object detection, we have to look into a slightly different direction. So here the idea would be to identify essentially the area where the object of interest is. And you can already see here, if we use, for example, the methods that we learned in visualization, we would probably not be very happy because we would simply identify pixels that are related to that class. So this has to be done in a different way because we are actually then interested in finding the different instances. So we want to be able to figure out different cats in a single image and then find bounding boxes. So this is essentially the task of object detection and instance recognition. Now, lastly, when we have mastered those two ideas, then we also want to talk about the problem of instance segmentation. So here, it's not just that you find all pixels that show cats, but you actually want to differentiate different cats and assign the segmentations to different instances. So this is then instance segmentation, which will be in the last video about these topics. So let's go ahead and talk a bit about ideas towards image segmentation. Now, in image segmentation, we want to find exactly which pixels belong to that specific class. And we want to delineate essentially the boundary of meaningful objects. So all of these regions that are within the boundary should have the same label and they belong to the same category. So each pixel gets a semantic class and we want to generate a pixel-wise dense labeling. So these concepts are, of course, here shown on images, but technically you can also do similar things on sound when you, for example, look into spectrograms. So the idea in images would be that we want to make out of the left-hand image the right-hand image. And you can see already that we find the region that is identified by the airplane here, and we find the boundary.
course, this is a more simple task here. You can also think about more complex scenes, like this example here from autonomous driving. And here we are, for example, interested in where the street is, where persons are, where are pedestrians, where are vehicles, and so on. And we want to mark them in this complex scene. And similar tasks can also be done for medical imaging. For example, if you're interested in identification of different organs, where the liver is, where the vessels are, or where cells are. So, of course, there's many, many more applications that we won't talk here about. There's aerial images, if you process satellite images, of course, also in robotics, and also image editing, where you can show that these kind of techniques have very useful properties. So, of course, if we want to do so, we need to talk a bit about evaluation metrics. And, of course, we have to be somehow able to measure the usefulness of a segmentation. And this depends then on several factors, of course, the execution time, memory footprint, and of course the quality. And the quality of a method we need to assess with different metrics. The main problem here is that very often the classes are not equally distributed. So we have to somehow account for that. So we can do that by also expanding the number of classes with a background class. And then we can determine, for example, the probability of the pixel of class i to be inferred to belong to class j. So, for example, pii would then represent the number of true positives. This then brings us to several metrics. For example, the pixel accuracy, that would be the ratio between the amount of correctly classified pixels and the total number of pixels. The mean pixel accuracy, which is the average ratio of correctly classified pixels per class basis. And more common, actually, to evaluate segmentations are then things like the mean intersection over union, which is then the ratio between the intersection and the union of two sets, and the frequency-weighted intersection over union, which is then a balanced version where you also incorporate the class frequency into this measure. So with these measures, then we can figure out what is a good segmentation. And then we go ahead and, of course, we follow the ideas of using fully convolutional networks for segmentation. Now, so far, if we have been using fully convolutional networks, we essentially had a high-dimensional input, the image, and then we used the CNN for the feature extraction. And then the outputs were essentially the distributions over different classes. And then we had essentially a vector encoding the class probabilities. So you could also transform it into a fully convolutional neural network where you then essentially parse the entire image and transform it into a heat map. So we've seen similar ideas already in visualization when we talked about the different activations. So we could essentially also follow this line of interpretation and then we would get a very low dimensional, very coarse heat map for the class tabby cat. So this is, of course, one way you can go. But of course, you will not be able to identify all the pixels that belong to that specific class. So what you have to do is you somehow have to get the segmentation or the class information back to the original image resolution. And here, the key idea is not just to use a CNN as an encoder, but you also use a decoder. So we end up with a structure that looks like this kind of, you could even say hourglass, where we have this CNN encoder and a CNN decoder that does the upsampling again. And this is, by the way, not an autoencoder because the input is the image, but the output is the segmentation mask. And the encoder part of the network is essentially a CNN. And this is very similar to CNN techniques that we already talked about quite a bit. So on the other side, we need a decoder. And this decoder then is used to upsample the information again. And there are actually several approaches how to do this. One of the early ones is Long et al.'s fully convolutional networks. There's also SegNet in reference one. And I think the most popular one 
is UNET. And this is also the paper that I hinted at that has the many references. So UNET is really popular. And you can see that you can check the citation found every day. Well, let's discuss how we can do this. And this is the upsampling part. So here we want to have a decoder that somehow is creating a pixel-wise prediction. There's different options possible. And one is, for example, unpooling. You can also do transpose convolutions, which essentially is then not using the idea of pooling, but the idea of convolution, but transpose, such that you increase the resolution instead of doing a subsampling. So let's look at those upsampling techniques in some more detail. Of course, you can do something like the nearest neighbor unpooling. There, you then simply take the low resolution information and you unpool simply by taking the nearest neighbor. There's the bed of nails unpooling, which then takes just a single value and you just put it at one of the locations so the remaining image will look like a bed of nails. So the idea here is, of course, that you just put the information at the position where you know that it belongs. And then the remaining missing entries should be filled up by a learnable part that is then introduced in a later step of this network. Another approach is using the max pooling indices. So here the idea is that in the encoder pass, you perform max pooling and you save the indices of where the pooling actually occurred. And then you can take this information in the upstempling step again, and you write the information exactly at the place where the maximum came from. So this is very similar to what you would be doing in the backpropagation step of the maximum pooling. So of course, there's also learnable techniques like the transpose convolution. Here you learn an upsampling which is then sometimes also called deconvolution. But what you actually do is you have a filter that moves essentially two pixels in the output for every one pixel in the input. And you can control higher upsampling with the stride. So let's look at this example here. Here we have this single pixel that then gets unpooled. And here you produce this 3 by 3 transpose convolution. Here we show it with a stride of 2. Then we move to the next pixel, and you can see that an overlap area emerges in this case. And there you have to do something about this overlap area. For example, you could simply sum them up and hope that in the subsequent processing, your network learns how to deal with this inconsistency in the upsampling step. And we can go ahead and do this for the other two pixels in this example. And then you see that we have this cross-shaped area. So the transpose convolution results in an uneven overlap when the kernel size is not divisible by the stride. And these uneven overlaps on the axis multiply, and they create this characteristic checkerboard artifact. In principle, as mentioned before, you should be able to learn how to remove those artifacts again in subsequent layers. In practice, it causes struggle, and we recommend to avoid it completely. So how can this be avoided? Well, you choose an appropriate kernel size. You choose the kernel size in a way that it is divisible by the stride. And then you can also do separate upsampling from convolution to compute the features. So for example, you could resize the image using a neural network or bilinear interpolation, and then you add a convolution layer. So this would be typical approaches to do this. Okay, so until now we understood all of the basic steps that we need in order to perform image segmentation. And actually in the next video we will then talk about how to actually integrate the encoder and the decoder to get good segmentation masks. And I may already tell you there's a specific 
trick that you have to do because if you don't do this trick you will probably not be able to get a very good segmentation result. So please stay tuned for the next video because there you will see how you can do good segmentations and you will learn about all the details of these advanced segmentation techniques. So thank you very much for listening and see you in the next video. Bye bye.